All right, everybody, how you doing tonight? It's time for the Rot Gut Review. So glad you all could make it. I'm very, very excited for our guests tonight. They are, I'm actually a little nervous. I'm going to be honest. I'm a little nervous. These are some, some big wigs in the world of bourbon, and uh, they obviously haven't watched this show. Otherwise, they never would have come on. Let's face it. Uh, but I, before we get started, I do want to see who all is in the chat. I see some of our good friends already. Tom Lynch, thank you for stopping by. Sugar Kitty, Wheels, my man Andrews Farrell, Bourbon Bites is in. He can't watch t right now, but he is on right after this stream. So go watch him. Make sure to do that. Uh, Steve A, out there Batmanning. Love you, Steve. Whiskey Encore, good to see you. Robotic says, Rot Gang. I, I can't believe I've never thought of using that. I'm disappointed with myself. I should, we should start calling ourselves that. Absolutely, I love that. Uh, Emily Chambers, Wesley, Robert Rees, Gary White, good to see all of you. Put in the chat what you're drinking tonight because it should be Bardstown. And if it's not, why isn't it? But, oh, actually, sorry, Bourbon Bites is not on later tonight, so don't go watch him. You wouldn't be able to. He's out traveling, apparently. But make sure to subscribe to him later so you can watch him later. All right. I have, like I say, a couple of guests tonight. So they're from the Bardstown Bourbon Company, which I'm sure all of you have heard of. It's kind of the new hotness in the world of bourbon. So... Let's get to introducing him. First of all, we have Mr. Dan Calloway. He's the Vice President of Product Development and Hospitality for Bardstown Bourbon. Thank you so much for coming on, Dan. Awesome to be here. Thanks yeah. for having me. And Mr. John Hargrove, who is the Chief Operating Officer down at Bardstown. And I am super excited to talk to you about everything you're doing right now. Thank you for awesome. coming on. Yeah, excited to be on. Thanks for having us on tonight. So uh, we're excited to do this tonight. So we've got some good stuff to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. So I figured we should start out. So Discovery and uh, Fusion Series 4 just landed here in Wisconsin. I figured we should start out with the Fusion Series uh, tonight. And this has been a crazy hot ticket item. Here in Wisconsin, I work at Ray's Liquor and here in uh, Milwaukee, and we sold something like, I was telling these guys before we went on, we sold like 60 some odd cases within the first two days of this coming out. It is nuts. People are so excited for this. So for the people at home who maybe don't aren't familiar with the Fusion series, would you tell them a little bit about that? Yeah, sure thing. Um, fusion, it, just like the name, right? It's a, it's a fusion between young bourbon distilled at Bardstown Bourbon Company because we started distilling in 2016. So our oldest product is about four and a half years old. So we take that bourbon and create a fusion with the young and the old. More importantly, older source bourbon. More importantly, it's a fusion of all the perspectives we have under one roof from our distilling team led by master distiller Steve Nally. John Hargrove, head distiller Nick Smith, to our culinary team, executive chefs uh, Stu Plush, to our incredible beverage team. We all come together, taste it, look at the flavor profiles, and create a spectacular blend. So yeah. it's, uh, it's really about the team, this Fusion series. Absolutely. Um, I do see ADH whiskeys in. I'm pretty sure you crowned him the best whiskey taster <laughs> in the world not too long ago. Well deserved. <laughs> so... One of the things I was saying I really, really love about the Fusion series and Discovery, but Fusion especially, is how you guys put all the mash bills and the ages right on the side of the label. Yep, that's that's what we're all about. We say we're about innovation, collaboration, and then transparency. So everything we do, we come out with, we're going to tell you exactly what you're drinking, the age, the source the mash bill uh, right here on the label. So full transparency there. Absolutely. Now, I did want to ask because 
this was something uh, my, one of my patrons, Mitch Weddle, really wanted me to ask you guys was with you guys are making 40 some odd mash bills, right? Which is bonkers for one distillery to be making that that many different mash bills. He wanted to know, you know, was that intended from the beginning? You know, when you were founded, were you always planning to do that many mash bills? And also, like, what technical, you know, aspects did you have to do to prepare to make that many different ones? Yeah, uh, great question. So with our program, Collaborative Stilling Program, like you said, we have 40 plus mash bills, uh, 30 plus customers in there. So what really allowed us um, to have the flexibility um, uh, to keep with these quality profiles on each of these mash bills is really make a flexible system and one that a produces consistent quality product B to the specs of our collaborative distilling partners. Uh, so over the course of growing since 2016, um, we have gotten to work with some great people out of those 32 different companies. So their technical teams come on board like Dan touched on earlier. Uh, we're transparent. Uh, we're collaborative and the team aspect of it. So we've worked hand in hand with other technical teams, other distillers. Uh, but the number one thing that we have is the team that we build at BBC. So we have a very technical team, uh, a team with a story background, average experience out on the, the production of floors, 15 years in the distillery. Uh, so we have a team that's great. We built a great distillery and we continually to evolve. Uh, through how we measure quality metrics, how we mine data from the instrumentation on the production floor uh, to really make real-time decisions uh, to increase our efficiencies and to go after that um, ev ever chasing that perfect bourbon, right? That's everything that every day duty we have at Bardstown Bourbon is how we can make quality better through processes, with people, through blends, through new innovation, thinking outside the box. So. We welcome anybody to come down uh, when things open up and uh, we'll show you everything. So like Dan said, we're transparent. You can go into our labs, go on a production floor, talk to our operators and really get to see firsthand uh, feet through the door how, how bourbon's made at the Barstown Bourbon Company. Very cool. And obviously now your, your own products are just bourbon, but you're making a variety of other whiskeys for your collaborative process. Correct. Yeah. So we're making uh, two, three, four, five grain bourbons. We're making rye whiskey, wheat and whiskey, American grain and single malts and tons of experimentation. For our collaborations, we partner with uh, breweries, um, even uh, other distilleries now, brandy, rum um, and even different winemakers in Napa Valley. Uh, so what we've done there is uh, we we purchase a lot of bulk uh, product, obviously, but then we put uh, our own spin working with these different collaborative partners uh, in different awesome finishes. So Cabernet Savion, the Prisoner Series, Chateau de la Vaud, um, Goodwood. Um, am I allowed to say Plantation Rum yet? I, no, I you are. You just did. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that'll be coming out later this year, right? So a lot of cool, cool collaborations teed up. Um, and I guess if it hasn't been said yet, I, I just let the cat out of the bag. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I know they, I, that was told to me. I know our rep mentioned it. I didn't okay. know if that was public knowledge, but yeah. I guess now it is. So yeah, I'm very excited for that. I'm very, very excited for that. I know Emily Chambers is saying she really appreciates the ultra transparency from the jump. So, right. Yeah. And we want that to kind of define, define us, right? I mean, uh, bourbon uh, consumers, whiskey consumers, they're, they're more and more educated. They want to know uh, where their product comes from. They got a quality mindset, right? So if we're sourcing, we're going to tell you we're sourcing. If we're blending, uh, we're showing you that uh, older bourbon uh, blended with younger bourbon. There's some bright notes in younger bourbons that really complement the older bourbons. And so we want to take you on that journey with us. So the transparency of the Mashville uh, in our fusion brand, um, is part of that, but also it allows you to see what kind of quality you are producing at the younger ages, but still blend it to get ready for uh, four full releases of 100% produced Barstown bourbon, uh, whiskey and bourbon here uh, starting in 2023. Uh, so we're going to come out with uh, two weeded, a high and a low wide, low weeded bourbon, a rye bourbon and a rye whiskey here in 2023. 
That's 100% produced at BBC. So six-year bourbons uh, that we'll come out with, that'll be straights. So we kind of shied away from releasing, you know, like two-year, 100% produced at BBC, three, four, five. So we want to start hitting that sweet spot, and then we'll hold back inventories for eight, 10, 12-year releases. But we really wanted to show that evolution of our product aging and the quality uh, that it's really lending to our finished goods. And what better way to bring those bright notes out than to uh, uh, blend it with those older notes uh, and those older bourbons with some awesome stocks that we, we've acquired throughout the years. Yeah. Sure. And there sure. is one one great way to taste it by itself. Every tour, if you come down and visit, at the end of every tour, you get to thieve out of a barrel, taste it 100% oh, straight. We're, we're at about four years on that barrel. So you can see a uh, sneak peek at cast strength of where we're going. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, I love that so much, man. So speaking of coming down to the distillery, I know, Dan, part of your job description is vice president of hospitality. I've never actually talked to someone with that particular <laughs> job description. Yeah. What, what, is it, what is it that you do as part of, part of that job? Hospitality to me is, is, I mean, that's my background. That's where I come from. That's what I believe in is, is really, if someone takes the time to come down and visit us, I want, I want them to see the true company, right? We, what we have to offer. It's more than just a bourbon tour. It's the people. It's our fantastic restaurant, full service restaurant, our bar, cocktail classes, pairings. It's, it's what we call the modern bourbon experience. And no matter what, from the moment you uh, set foot in the door, you're going to feel comfortable, welcomed, and, and ready for an immersive experience. So uh, I work on that side of things. It's, it's, it's a blast. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I have to say, here's yeah. a picture of your a place to work, right? Yeah. Uh, we, we just developed some new rooms. Uh, the best way to see and get kind of a sneak preview is to go to bartownbourbon.com. And then hit tour. There's a 360 tour that takes you through every room. Uh, we have the only speakeasy lounge attached to a Rick house. In <laughs> so you can hang out, you know, take the from the barrel, enjoy a cocktail in, in, in our lounge. We have a vintage whiskey library with over 400 bourbons dating back to 1892, all available uh -huh. by the poor. You can have a dinner in there. And, and then just great spaces for private events or, or just hanging out with a friend at the bar. Absolutely. And, and the, the, the one other thing I'll touch on, the coolest thing, being Bardstown Bourbon Company, really celebrating Bardstown as the bourbon capital of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at our bar. We have everyone's product. And with that, we have, you know, 16 different distilleries uh, that are within a short drive. Their master distiller, their teams will come and have lunch, hang out. If you come by on a Friday afternoon, it's very likely there'll be a couple other distilleries hanging out. Very cool. Yeah. Ah, okay, real quick, as an aside, favorite product, favorite whiskey that isn't one of your own? Can I guess John's? Yes, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. Guess John's. Well, uh, a lot of people don't know John's the uh, uh, former master distiller. Uh, for Barton Brands at Sazerac, and, and I know he's a fan. I don't know if I'm going to say sweet wheat or foolproof. I'm going to go. I'm going to go sweet wheat. John, that's uh, my second favorite from there. Foolproof, <laughs> foolproof would be my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, so close! So you got close. my top two though. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I love the foolproof. So that's awesome. Yeah. And 1792 overall is great. I'm less of a fan of the sweet wheat because I really like the spice, but the full yeah. proof is right, right in my my range. John, do you want to guess Dan's? Oh, probably a pina colada or something. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. Sitting on a pina colada, like, reading all those books behind you. you know, yeah. That's, 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 that's my night. <laughs> Anything oh. with an umbrella, I'm good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I got to say, and I've been, I've talked about this previously on stream, looking at the distillery, you know, how the distillery looks, the design and the design of the bottles too. They are, this is something I've said before. I really don't like that when whiskey marketing stays too much stuck in the past, not to say you can't take stuff from the past, but I really like how these just the design really is moving away from a lot of what you've seen with other 
bourbon brands that tend to stay with a certain old timey Southern style look. This is much more sleek, much more, I don't know, kind of, Modern. it's a fresh look. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we really try to balance that respecting the tradition because uh, obviously we know how important um, the traditions of the industry are, the art of the industry. And what we really like to do is push the science and uh, show the modernness uh, that it can balance with the traditional aspect of it, the art, the great stories, uh, the methods developed to produce the bourbon uh, while improving on a lot of that and pushing the envelope on how to make bourbon modern at the same time while we respect in the past. Uh, so that's where we really pride ourselves in trying to find that that balance. But uh, at 2016, the height of the bourbon boom, right? We, we had to come on the scene and really set ourselves apart. Uh, so we think while looking towards the future, while honoring the past and finding that right balance, uh, we thought there was a place in the market for the Bardstown Bourbon Company. And that's shown through the architecture of our buildings, the architecture of our bottle that you just showed, the team we've built and the product we're coming out, the pushing boundaries on the blending side, um, really looking at all these different innovations from uh, grain procurement, the barrel procurement, and then blending, a uh, new bottling facility, 53,000 square foot bottling facility we're building on site to open up in May. So uh, we really want not only for our own brand, but to offer that to other brands that are growing too, uh, that are in our collaborative program. So we really want to help the industry out and just not help ourselves and find that median. So what's good for one distillery is good for all distilleries in this, because uh, ultimate goal, we want to make bourbon better. We want to reach more bourbon drinkers. And I, I think through quality and innovation, we can do that. Sure. I'll, I'll touch on something real quick. Uh, you know, I think it is one of the most innovative distilleries you'll see. And, and John is leading that. But what he talks about respecting the past, he gave out uh, this book and you can speak to it. I don't know the year it was written. 1950s. The Art of Distilling book is one he gives to the entire team to read kind of start there where, with the basics and get that core down and then understanding that and then innovating. John, you can speak to that book. Uh, yeah, it's an old Seagram's manual on distillation, yeah, okay. right? So it's a good read if you guys uh, haven't looked at it. Um, some people might put asleep on page three, but if you're like me, <laughs> you probably read it uh, probably a hundred different times. As uh, Early on, they figured out a lot of stuff that is still within practice and just not within practice, the best way of doing stuff that we still know today. Uh, but other things uh, we're able to improve on with innovations. But that's why I say if, if there's something that's good and not broke, don't fix it, right? Honor it um, and, and really hold it in high regards and leverage that while pushing the boundaries and you'll be successful. Sure. So I know Bardstown now has something of a reputation for being one of the most cutting edge in terms of technology and innovations. Can you speak to some specific innovations that you feel have made the biggest difference? Yeah, just um, basically how we control our whole system. So there's a lot of off the shelf packages. And what I mean by that is on our production floor, how we control milling to mashing, to fermentation, to distillation, uh, to blending, to analytical chemistries, and how we gather all that data and make real time decisions on so we actually purchased uh, what they call an open source SCADA software. So it's a software program um, that we can program ourselves. And we put over 900 programming hours. Uh, we have a great engineer, Roger Henley. Um, he's a programmer also. So we actually built our own homegrown system uh, to control all of our technology, uh, putting over 400 uh, instruments feeding data back into this system where we can really make different control points that our customers uh, really dictate how they like to run their system, right? We call it their system because they get to come in, work side by side. So when I pull a barrel out in 10 years, I can trace it all the way back to the farmer it came from, what the HPLC results were, what the mass spec GC results were, what the 24 hour beer chemistries were, how it went, went through the cooker, then how it went through fermentation for three days, what the set temperature was, what the control temperature was, what the still metrics were, the low wines, the high wines, the entry proofs, what type of barrel, the Cooper specs. So we can really get a full data package on that barrel, trace it through the years. So when it comes out, we know exactly why that barrel is so good. And then that'll help our blending team decide what blends are put into it. 
And the next thing, we're always looking to innovate and always looking to control. So I don't say we're fully automated. We have a great team of seven people running the distillery on the production side 24 seven a day. So you still have to have that human element and have that art uh, to really dictate what the system and how the system interprets that data to make decisions also. And with those two, two, two elements, the human and the science, uh, the automated part, portion, we have balanced it well, just like the art and science into a, a very flexible, very consistent system uh, that produces very clean whiskey distillate. Sure. And, and now we're putting those innovations in the barrel too. So, so it doesn't just stop with distilling. We're now looking, tracking all the metrics through the actual aging with this, this smart bung technology. That's yeah. pretty cool. Cutting edge. Oh, that, that freaked me out because our rep showed us that and how you can see exactly the humidity, the temperature, the exact position in the, the Rick house where your barrel is. Yep. So it's that a, blew my mind, man. A virtual mock-up, you can see like if you were to uh, come into our single barrel program, you can pick a barrel, it shows the mash bill. Right now we have instrumentation in the warehouse where these single barrels are being stored. It does humidity, location, um, temperature variances, the seasonality. It gathers all that data for you to where you can pull up on an app anywhere in the world and see how your barrel's aging. And on top of that, we're looking at different uh, sonic and radar technologies to show what the liquid level is. And then we can pull samples and run that through our quality analysis to show how the chemical, uh, the chemical compound of that bourbon's changing from year to year. And you as a customer, let's say Ed can look and be like, Oh my gosh, look at all my higher alcohols, how much they're reducing this year, what that means in flavor, what the what what the predicted yield how many bottles if i pull up six years i could pull up eight years that i'm going to have for my store so that'll feed back all that information so it's something that's evolving uh on a monthly basis right now too but you've seen the base of it it sounds like so we're really excited about that yeah that's fantastic uh bubble bath wants to know can it <laughs> send a push notification when someone leaves a sample out of it <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it actually, um, yes, when we get to the level indicators, uh, there's, uh, it's, it's just not a fancy uh, instrument telling us yield. It also, also leak detection. So you've heard of the angel share. Uh, you've heard of evaporation losses. Well, barrels still do leak. Uh, so in the past, uh, distilleries have done manual checks. Uh, we go through a full physical inventory every year of every single barrel on site. Uh, looking for leak checks, looking for drips in the warehouses. So theoretically, if somebody were to go put their straw down into a barrel and have a good afternoon, we could set alarms on the on the level of the liquid and how much it drops. Uh, to really bring it up. <laughs> we're not there yet, but that's the technology we're looking at and prototyping right now. That's amazing. That's so cool. That's just so cool. Um, so speaking of the actual process of getting these out, I would like to talk about the actual, the blending and how you guys are doing that because <coughs> with a lot of different whiskeys here and I'm guessing a lot of different, a lot of different flavors. Could you talk to us about the process of how you put, well, I'm going to pour myself some discovery series four, awesome. uh, which I freaking love by the way, but would you be able to walk us through kind of how, you know, something like this gets put together? Yeah. Love to. Uh, and Discovery 4 it could be uh, Bourbon of the Year coming out. So enjoy. Oh, my God. I was it's an early contender for me. Early I gotta contender. Say. So I, I think with our blends, that's that's just as innovative how we approach that. There's no master blender on site. It mm. truly is a team approach between beverage, culinary and distilling. So every department uh, can send representatives to, to sit on the tasting panel and vote on what blend eventually will become Discovery 4. We do everything blind. Uh, we line up the submissions. Uh, anyone can submit a blend, you know, with, with all the different source bourbon out there, put their ratio together. Um, then we line them up. Works like an NCA Final Four bracket where different ones will knock each other out, score it on um, just kind of a standard Seagram scale, tally the votes blind, and the best bourbon is almost always unanimous by the time we get to the finals. And we've also, on the early discoveries, they came out cast strength. Now we spend a whole session just on the proofing and blind taste the products at different proofing 
to, to really celebrate that art of proofing as well as blending. Um, so it, it's a really cool progress uh, process that we're proud of. Yeah, I, I would say proofing is very underestimated, right? A lot of people love the cast strength. And a lot of people do it for um, uh, economies of scale to get more, more bottles out of the barrel. Uh, but if you're looking truly at quality, three, four or five proof points can make a huge difference in quality either way to the good or the bad. It can really enhance something. Let's say you take out of the barrel at 120, it can be really good at 115 or even better at 105, depending on the recipe. Mm -hmm. sure. um, Emily Chambers is asking, uh, well, she's pointing out that it's very cool that there's a culinary focus. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting way of putting it because I, I guess from my perspective, I don't really think about things. I, I probably should think about bourbon more as food, but I don't. Yeah. I mean, so we, we run a, I know yeah. Dan has a lot to say on this, but I'll just touch on it real quick. Traditionally, distilleries have a master blender, right? And so we have a team where there's a lot of different backgrounds and different viewpoints. Uh, bartenders really get to interact with a lot of people at the bar, what type of profiles they like. Chefs get to really interact uh, with with their um, customers on what pairings they like. So everybody has great viewpoints that can add something to a blend that can really highlight great parts of the different separate parts. And when they're combined, just makes something phenomenal. Uh, so instead of just having, say, myself or Dan in a lab, uh, we know what good whiskey tastes like. We know what good bourbon tastes like. But just imagine the team coming up with and all the outside the box thinking. Um, it just really is a great recipe for a good product when you have the right people from different backgrounds, different specialties, different viewpoints in the room working together. Sure. Now, would you excuse me for one moment? My co-host is calling me, my usual co-host, who usually is supposed to be on here. Uh, she's calling me for some reason, um, and I'm not sure why. I wonder if there's something wrong with the stream. <laughs> I wonder if there's an issue here. Erica, if, you, if you're watching right now and there's an issue with the stream, please just tell me in the chat. I'm not trying to interrupt these guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, but yeah, and, and then one note, you know, different people submit the blends. Discovery 4 uh, was actually submitted by our executive chef, Stu Plush. So it uh, really ties into the story there. Okay, very cool. All right, well, the stream is running fine, so hopefully hopefully that's not why she was trying to reach out to me. She would have been here. I told her, I told her, we're drinking bourbon. You love bourbon. And then she said, it's probably going to be a bunch of nerd shit, right? And I was like, yeah, it's going to be a bunch of nerd shit. <laughs> All right. Oh, the chain is on the door. She's trying to get in the room. <laughs> the stream is going on pause. <laughs> Funny. That's weird. I never put the chain on the door. Uh, all right. Anyway, professionalism at its best. This is what you. Uh, this is what you came to see, right, everyone? <laughs> all right. Anyway, getting back to discovery, the discovery series. I freaking love this whiskey. This Me is fantastic. I gotta say. Um, yeah. To me, this really shows the strength of Kentucky bourbon, right? Uh, I, we, we think we'll branch out from here and go to other other areas, but you've got three aged Kentucky bourbons sourced from different locations, 10-year, 13-year, 15-year, really just a celebration of Kentucky on this one. Yeah, and I don't believe, I get the feeling you're not allowed to tell us where they're sourced from, but I'm sure we could figure it out. Relatively, relatively easy. <laughs> yeah, we, we want to be as transparent as as we possibly can, and putting those mash bills on there uh, with a with a little Google, you can get there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we already did do. Eric and I did a review of this one. Uh, she liked it. Was not quite as gung ho about it as I was, but yeah, definitely 
early contender for bourbon and maybe just whiskey period of the year. And yeah. I don't say that lightly because I'm way more of a rye drinker. So this one really impressed me. <laughs> yeah, I would just say our Discovery brand in general is really celebrating um, the different stocks out there, where they come from, honoring the other distilleries. Even though we may not be able to say the specific DSP that it came from, we can do state and Mashville. But I'll just tell you, we're looking at everywhere in the world uh, uh, at the different bourbons, bourbon stocks or whiskey stocks, different bourbons in the U.S. Um, that we can get our hands on and really innovate uh, Canadian whiskeys, Irish whiskeys things like that, that might go into this brand in the future. So we look at truly everything to see what could be the best blend, hence discovery. We're looking around everywhere uh, for great whiskey and bourbon to blend together and really showcase our capabilities from the blending side. Yeah. So we might see, we might see like an Irish whiskey in a discovery at some point. And we're looking at it. It's on so, the table. Well, it was really cool. John and I put a blend together uh, a few months back that used a single malt with bourbon you know mm. so it's like american whiskey just we're both fired up on on that flavor profile so we're gonna see uh see where we can go with that as well that sounds pretty freaking cool uh bubble bath is asking are you distilling anything specifically for cocktails you know kind of like whistle pig did with piggyback not uh not yet i will say our fusion that we tasted first with with the beverage you know being such beverage team being such an important part cocktails are in mind with this it's it's developed to be a standalone bourbon it's a beautiful sipper but it always sits around that 9500 proof point with the strong rye content especially having that 60 40 rye in there uh 40 rye really can punch through ginger stand up in a manhattan and old-fashioned i think with every product we we come out with but specifically the fusion we're always thinking about how that how it would work in certain cocktails. Sure, sure. And I got to say, with that sixty percent uh, corn, forty percent rye on this fusion here, that got me excited. I have to imagine working with that particular mash bill has to be quite a bit different from working with a regular bourbon. Particularly, I would imagine mashing and fermenting. But yeah, I mean, so um, there's a lot of natural enzymes in malted barley, right? So uh, we got to substitute that uh, with uh, commercially available enzymes and really bring out those um, uh, those processes uh, um, um, synthetically, right? So uh, in the cooking process, uh, really break down those long chain starch molecules. Oh, I think oh, he was no. going to say molecule. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna remove John back. and bring it back right quick. We'll see if that fixes it. There he oh, is. Hey John. <laughs> I, was, I was probably getting into a boring talk anyway. <laughs> well, you, I said I knew you were gonna say molecule, but then I couldn't finish the past <laughs> then. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it's a uh, long story short, it's a fun recipe to make. Um, it's one of those innovative things, uh, working with different distilleries. Um, uh, we get to see and learn a lot of Mm, awesome. No, I and trust me, the people who are watching this stream love the nerdy crap. So talk it, talk up the nerdy crap, please. Everyone, I'm sure, wants to. They don't want to hear me talking about shit. They want to hear you guys talking about specifics of making bourbon. <laughs> All right, you you'll get John fired up. He can uh, <laughs> get him going. Now, I did want to ask. So for your collaborative program, I believe it, this is all column distillation. Am, am I correct in that? Correct. Yeah. So you're there's no like option for someone to say choose a pot still or a hybrid still for your custom distilling. It would all have to be column distilled. Uh, currently, but I will say not yet. Oh. Um, <laughs> so. Um, yeah, that, that'll be the, the Easter egg I dropped, too, <laughs> along with the plantation. So, All kinds of secrets. Yeah, we got a lot of projects going on. So, obviously, we're, we're looking right now um, to see if it's um, in our best interest. We're looking at a Scottish-Irish-style hybrid uh, a double pot system with um, rectifier uh, uh, hybrid in there also. So, one-of-a-kind system that can do... Uh, the different Lynn arms for the Irish versus Scottish, 
Uh, so it's a really cool, flexible setup that we're looking at uh, to make those single malts, experimental bourbons, um, or even vodkas, let's say, if we ever wanted to, which we won't. Uh, um, but yes, uh, like I said, we really push the envelope on innovation and equipment design and uh, process design also. Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate how how much you spit out. We could make a vodka. We won't. Yeah, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> I would love I would love to see my gear guys' take on something like single pot still Irish. If you you know did something like that, that would be if any any American producer, but you, like that would be crazy. Yeah. yeah. It it's not you know too far fetched that we, we get rolling on something like that. Uh, yeah. Things tend to happen very quickly. You know, we, we, we're we flexible and uh, always, always, we say never stand still. So always moving forward, trying to find next step. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Sugar Kitty is asking, are the enzymes you're using for uh, to replace the barley, are those proprietary or readily available? So they're readily available. Uh, you can go to DuPont, Guzmer Enterprises, um, so there's a lot of great enzyme companies out there, actually. Um, uh, no need for proprietary enzymes. We need them to do certain jobs, right? As far as alpha, beta, glucoamylase. So um, I'm sure there is proprietary that some distilleries have, but uh, we have specific tasks that we want these certain enzymes to do, and they're just so happen to be commercially available. So no need to reinvent the wheel uh, when it comes to that. Sure, sure. What about for yeast strains? Are you guys using any proprietary yeast strains? Uh, we are for our customers. Uh, and then we use uh, a number, I think we're up to 12 different yeast strains that we use across the board, dry activated yeast, liquid yeast. Um, so a, a lot of cool different strands that create a lot of different profiles in fermentation. So. How does, and how do you go about selecting what type of yeast you want to use with what mash bill? Yeah, so there's, it just depends on there's different yeast strains that uh, create fruitier profiles, uh, a lot of different congeners um, in fermentation that can carry over to distillation. So we really work with our customers and let's say we even consider ourselves an internal customer, right? So what do we want out of our rye whiskey? What do we want out of our high rye bourbon, high rye, high rye wheat? So we really aim for the profile and then with a combination, how are we going to maximize yield per bushel? Because we want to break down as much starch as we can into those one, two, three molecules uh, that the yeast will be able to feed on and maximize that eight to 10 percent alcohol content in our fermentation and strip that out in the distillation process. So number one is the profile we want to look at, two, followed by the efficiency to make alcohol as yeast, as you know, plays a huge part in that and just which ones are less susceptible to bacteria, et cetera, and will really produce a great fermentation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Tom Lynch is wondering, how did you guys, you know, get into contract distilling and selling source products? Because it seems like nobody else, you know, started so little while ago and is doing as much as you guys are. Yeah, so it back i'll say back to 2016 we joined at like when bourbon's booming right so we had to, to be different so we bought a lot of stock early on uh we wanted to really uh um, like i said just not put a two-year bourbon out there a three-year bourbon that was produced here we really wanted to introduce a quality product right off the bat and build uh, we know it takes time to build a brand you don't build a brand overnight uh, so it takes time to gather these stocks like we didn't, uh, we put out our first product in 2018 that, uh, and not right when we opened uh, or before we opened, some non distillers producers put something out in a, uh, under a year than when they were created. So we spent time gathering stocks, uh, MGP stocks, um, Dickel stocks, uh, a lot of cool barrels out there. Um, and then slowly we started to use those to kick off our collaborations because those are 100% source, but then we put our touch of finishing on it. And then we got into discovery, uh, which is 100% source, but showcases our blending. And now at year three, year four, we can start introducing 
what our product is at a younger age. So we really wanted to focus on the brand, introduce a slow distribution network. We're only in 12 markets right now. It went like four, eight, 10, 12 markets. We're getting ready to add two more. So as we ramp up, uh, we can slowly start introducing more of our bourbon, 100% produced here in 23. Uh, so it's all about how do you really get out there and make an impact in the industry slowly, but methodically and efficiently with quality on the mind, innovation on the mind, consumers on the mind, uh, while making a great company and building a great culture. So. Absolutely. So your question. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's awesome. And I would, I would, I also want to ask Dan, like, I know we've talked about a little bit about the, the blending process and, you know, everyone coming together and kind of figuring out what the new product is going to be. But I would love to know more about like, you know, as you've built more products, what is, how does that work? How does that mindset, what is the plan around making new products and development? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I think that just comes down to we're, we're so fortunate to be in a company is flexible. You know, we're not, most distilleries you talk to are owned by a, you know, a giant, conglomerate corporation that, that controls decisions. We have a monthly innovation meeting where we, we bring together about 15 people and we just we just talk about ideas, talk about where the industry is going, what would work. No, every idea is on the table, right? And, and if we want to do something, we have the people in that room to make the decision and then go after it. So that's how we come up with, with cool Innov and, uh, yeah. innovative ideas, yeah. We, we see what's doing great out on the market. I mean, a lot of great innovations aren't something new. It's something that's out there that somebody has made better, right? So we respect that. We respect what other distilleries are doing and how good a quality products they're putting out. So we kind of benchmark and then see how we can make something better, right? And some, something that's already great, how can we make that better? How can it pair with something else? How can we blend it with something else? So when we do these blinds, when we do our uh, fusion selections or discovery selections, um, uh, myself or Dan will actually sneak product in that our panel doesn't know about that's already up out in the market. So everybody oh, tastes, God. everybody tasting thinks, oh, these are submissions that were put in this round. Well, I might have a Kentucky Owl, I might have a Mictors in there to see how they blindly rate against what we're about to put on the market. So I can kind of uh, quantify uh, through a sensory panel, how we're going to stack up against what's out there. And then we can kind of pivot uh, and get direction where we want to go after that. So, Oh, that's fun. I like that. It's sneaky, but it's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> it's uh, blind taste. I mean, we believe in it. it. It'll humble you every now and then, but uh, sure. it'll really get at the truth of uh, what you're creating and what you're going to come out with. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. There is, I mean, the power of suggestion for what you like and what, you know, what you're enjoying. I, you can't overstate that because it's very easy to put something in somebody's head or have an expectation. Mm -hmm. um, Bubble Bath is wondering, or is there ever going to be uh, a peated whiskey barrel finished release? There's always somebody, there's always somebody who, who brings up Pete in a bourbon yeah. conversation. <laughs> I mean, bubble bath. Uh, yeah, there might now since you brought it up. We'll check that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we've definitely uh, looked at peated. Um, we've done uh, smoked mesquite malts already on bourbon recipes. Uh, so we've done a lot of cool stuff, uh, chocolate malt, things like that. Uh, so definitely we've looked at it on the finishing side. Something we'll definitely look at. Um, our innovation list is, I don't know how long of uh, a list of ideas is, um, we just, we're creative, but it's selecting and really vetting those ideas. That's probably takes the longest because you just don't want to order. Okay, let's get two, 300 barrels. Uh, and then you have to put four, 450 barrels in because of the yield loss. So it's a big investment when you start doing that. Uh, and you can get into big risk if you don't really vet the process and do your due diligence. So. Yeah, I, I'd be excited to look. Uh, we haven't done a peated yet, but definitely excited to look uh, down the road uh, as that is going forward as a possibility. All right. Uh, Adam T, I'm, I'm farming the comments for yeah, <laughs> the nice questions. Uh, would like to know what what is what makes Bardstown different from other crafty blenders? You know, Joe Mag, Cooper's Craft. 
what what is the ethos that you know makes you guys unique? Well, I, I think it's 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 what we've been covering, right? That modern bourbon experience of combining beverage, uh, culinary, and distilling as a complete team under one roof. Uh, I was just I had lunch today, and we were sitting next to the still. You know, you're uh, you're sitting on a couch. You're five feet from the dis, uh, the still. The the distilling team is through. It's it's really one unit uh, that's sharing ideas, and I don't know of anyone else that has that. Yeah, yeah, and the great part. Um... I'll tell people what, what's going off those stills and what's aging right now, four or five years. Um, that's what's going to go into our blends and the quality of what we're producing right now at BBC. That's going to set us apart. But I will also say this, um, you don't always have to be set apart. So those are some uh, great two places that were just mentioned, and that's some good company to be a part of. So why we like to be set apart and like high quality stuff, we like to be mentioned uh, with high quality people making high quality products also. So uh, uh, we can be set aside as a group also, I like to say, because uh, there's a <laughs> lot of cool people in this industry, a lot of cool companies in this industry, and we love working with them. And like I said, products number one uh, in our book. So um, there's other distillers, brewers, winemakers out there that we love to work with. That's cool. great. Point. Yeah, so speaking of which, um, let's talk about Pfeiffer Pavit. Because uh, I do have a problem with this one, I gotta say, and I'm, I'm sorry to have to say this, but why yeah. isn't there more of this? <laughs> <laughs> I had to, I had to bum a sample from my coworker. I couldn't even get a bottle. I had to bum a little bit from him. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Eric. By the way, if you're watching, thank you so much for passing this along. That's that's a special special bourbon there. Uh, so that's the second release of the Pfeiffer Pavit collaboration. <laughs> our collaborative series is taking our bourbon and putting it into a barrel that was previously used for another uh, wine, beer, or spirit. In this case, it's a Napa Valley uh, Calistoga uh, winery. Suzanne Pfeiffer Pavit, awesome winemaker. We're taking bourbon. Uh, and putting it into those barrels. So the first release was an eight-year bourbon aged for 18 months um, in those Napa Cabernet barrels. It won Best in Class San Francisco uh, World Spirits Award for finished bourbon. So we knew, you know, that that was our first uh, really wide release collaboration. We knew we were onto something. We knew we wanted to do it again. In this case, we took a 10-year bourbon. So a little richer, rounder, a little more oak notes on it. Um, just came out and, and i think it's i think it tops the first one so this Very is cool. so good man this is so good i just i gave a little bit to my old man before when i was over there just before this stream and he loved it i yeah i gotta say and just the, the way that wine works i get like this super cool like black current note absolutely and that's that's real typical of napa cabernet that just comes through and John can speak to the process of, of why I think these wine collaborations work so well, leaving that residual wine in the barrel and how we go about it. Yeah, so what's great about those, we're pretty methodical on prep instructions when we work at the brewery or winery. Uh, so a lot of people just get their barrels through brokers. These barrels have been sitting around for weeks and weeks on end, right? Barrels dry up, uh, the dregs dry up, they get rinsed out in the harvesting process. So what we really like to do is maximize that barrel and the product uh, that was in there prior because uh, the more uh, true we can keep to what was originally in there, the better the, the finish is gonna be. So our instructions are the, the minute they, they dump, dump what's ever coming out of that barrel, whether it be rum, wine, or beer, uh, especially any of the low proof stuff, uh, no rinsing, we fill with an inert gas like argon we put a bun back on, we seal the barrel, and we put it into a reefer truck, and then we overnight it to the Barstown Bourbon Company. That's called a live load, comes right off the truck, and we fill it with whiskey. So that barrel is barely empty, no chance for bacteria to grow. Uh, so it's really true to the nature of finishing, uh, and we think we maximize uh, what that product's gonna be uh, through that process. Um, John, why are you sharing all these prep instructions? Because finishes will be better for the industry, if everybody <laughs> follows that process. Yeah. And the coolest thing I think is I say it's proofed with wine instead of water because there's residual, you know, sometimes a gallon or two of wine in that barrel. Um, yeah. 
this is this is coming out cast strength, but around 100 proof because the wine interacts with the spirit. That 15% Cabernet brings down the total proof, makes it rich, round, viscous uh, because it was basically proofed with with Cabernet. Sure. Oh, man. Yeah. And it it really does show. It really does show up in this. Yeah. You know, I think there is something about port finishes, red wine finishes that I generally really, really love in bourbon way more so than I do in Irish or Scotch. And I'm not sure. Do you have a theory about why that is? Why that seems to work so much better? I think uh, the 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 natural sweet notes of bourbon play very well with black fruit. You know, mm. um, so we use a Tennessee uh, by design. We really like Tennessee on our wine finishes uh, because that sweet corn note, little bright citrus, just works with black currant, blackberry. Um, they just go to go so well together. And I, and I don't think you can achieve that with, with a malted product. Sure, man. It, I'm sorry, I'm gushing now. I'm just gushing over this cause I think it's so good. Um, but it really, really works. Um, I know you were yeah. saying plantation is next or one of the next ones. Maybe. Any, any other <laughs> cool collaborations you're allowed to let us yeah. know about? I don't, uh, there's, the plantation is the one we could talk. We're, we have a great relationship with uh, Pierre Ferrand. So we're going to do a Ferrand cognac um, as well as the plantation rum. And then the big one up in your neck of the woods is the founders KBS stout. Oh yeah. No, they did mention that. I forgot my ref mentioned that. Yeah. So that's yeah. in well, we actually just pulled samples of the three of those and, and they're all going to be great. That founders KBS stout is uh, pretty special. Oh man. So how do you, I mean, I suppose it just has to be, you just have to must taste these repeatedly and just see where, how they're developing just to make sure that the finish doesn't overwhelm the base spirit. Right? Yeah, I guess they're, they're that's about our literal, little escapade a couple of weeks ago in the warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> we and John, uh, you can follow us both on Instagram, uh, Johnny whiskey, Danny Bardstown. Um, we, we went on a little adventure into the Rick house to solve a mystery. Just like you said, we pulled the cognac just to check in on it. It's just been about seven months, eight months. And the barrel sample we had was so dark. It was almost black mm. so we went to the barrel team. And, and we're saying, did, did you pull it from the right barrel? Was this the stout? What's going on here? And it just turned out that, well, one that that barrel had aged quicker than any of the other barrels. The other that it's just it's going quicker than expected. So we have no set time that these need to finish, right? A lot of our wine finishes just happen to go 18 months. Others, they only go four months. We just, it's, it's an art to pull in it at that right time. Um, so that was the mystery of the black bourbon. <laughs> it sounds a lot like Balcones with their super dark stuff. And, and the, the, the release as a whole wasn't dark. It was just that barrel, just right. for whatever reason, happened to be aging very quickly. Huh. Yeah. I Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? They just, barrels can do whatever sometimes. They go one way or the other. You're never going to know. You just kind of got to monitor. Yeah. yeah, we got a lot of steps in that day, too. We were in three or four different warehouses <laughs> going up six or seven flights chasing that barrel. <laughs> I, we didn't bring, you know, we were just hanging out, but we, we didn't bring the right tools. We were walking back and forth. We, you know, <laughs> it wasn't our most professional moment, but we had a great time. Sure. Tasting the barrels and Gatorade cups. We <laughs> figured out the Glen Karens. It totally looked unprofessional. We both said to each other, I'm glad we're not in front of a tour right now. Or <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, you're on this show. You've seen how prof professional right. we are. So I'm not, I'm not judging anything. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I really do appreciate the amount of craft that goes into this. This is really cool. Um, so, and now I know Dickel was the one for Pfeiffer. Um, and you've obviously done a lot of sourcing from Kentucky. Are there, would you ever consider maybe sourcing some bourbon from, you know, other states, you know, other, you know, other craft distilleries doing something like that? Absolutely. And we, we had great success. I mean, with, with some MGP collaborations, we did uh, MGP with a um, Copper and Kings, Apple Brandy, um, mm. Chateau de la Baud, Armagnac, some great releases that featured that. 
that older um, MGP, and, we, and we're wide open. Like like John said, we we celebrate other distilleries, and if we're fans of them, we want to work with them. Very cool. Very cool. I think that's such a cool thing to be like, you know, don't view them as competition or, or as somebody we got to beat, but to view it, you know, as the community as a whole, the, all the distillers as a whole, everybody needs to celebrate each other. That's Ooh. pretty cool. Unless it's on the shelf, then we'll put our bottles. Right. In. Oh, right. of course. Right. Of course. Oops. There is such thing <laughs> as healthy competition, right? So uh, we believe the bourbon industry is a great example uh, of that. So um, and we honor that. Very cool. Very cool. So does anyone else have any more questions for Dan and John? This is the time to get them in because we're coming up on the end of our stream. So if you have anything you want to know about Bardstown, about how they're distilling, about what they're doing, you know, all that, put it in now. Um, I actually, I'm curious because obviously bourbon can only go up to 80% off the still. What are you allowed to tell us what you're distilling up to? Is there and does that depend on mash bill? Yeah, it depends on mash bill customer. Uh, but we've got up into the 150s before uh, for some customers on the high wines. You get above 160, you get into the light whiskey territory. Uh, we've um, we've done a mass balance, so we know how high we can get uh, and not produce bourbon and make really high proof spirits. Um, but we stay generally between 120 and 130 on our low wine and between 130 and 140 anywhere between on our high wine. And some high wines even down to 125 with a low wine of 118, 119. So um, it really depends on where the customer's at. Likewise with entry proofs, we're, we've done everything from 100 to 125 on entry proofs. So Yeah, okay, that's cool. Going all over. Uh, Eli is asking, if one barrel age is faster than the rest, is there a way to pause to let the rest catch up? Yeah, you, you absolutely can. We can tote one barrel, you know, and take it out of the aging process and then and then let the others keep going. Um, or we just take a composite blend as a whole. Farther down center of the warehouse, but if it's a, let's say that barrel's tagged to go into a larger batch, uh, we can note that and look at it when we go to blend that larger batch to see how it fits in. And we just may continue to let it age fast uh, and see how that can influence uh, uh, negatively or positive on the larger batch. Sure. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been a, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, no, I was just saying before we release, we can take a tiny sample of, you know, the batch and create the blend so mm -hmm. that we can, we can, like John said, see how it's going to function. Should we leave it out? Should we use it for something else or put it into the final blend? Sure. Has there ever been a barrel that turned in such a way that it was, actually unusable no such thing in this industry <laughs> <laughs> no, Everything has a value. yeah yeah there there's um we haven't ran into it specifically at, at at our facility but uh just the other day when we were in the barrel warehouse as dan told you um one had aged a lot faster than we expected compared to the rest of the lot um so that's when we really uh, decided to sample each barrel uh, out of all the different lots that were that were specked out for that batch. We blended it all together to ensure that the final blend uh, as a composite sample would be good in the end, which it was. Uh, but there's alcohol recovery companies if you don't want to use a barrel or barrels uh, that will come in and actually redistill and strip the ethanol out um, and then make a byproduct uh, after the fact. Uh, so that, that's definitely an option. Uh, but if you're good at distilling, good at aging, you shouldn't have to do that. Sure. Wow. I, I had no idea that such a company even existed. Yep. Um, yep. It's called, actually, I'll give them a plug, Parallel Products out of Louisville, Kentucky. So, there you go. Adam T. Not getting paid there. by him either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to put paid promotion maybe yeah. in the, <laughs> on this video. Uh, Adam T is wondering, did you guys like uh, Discovery 3 or 4 more? Got to choose between your children, apparently. That's a hot button question. Uh, <laughs> I will say what we haven't done with 4 is, is the real test that we did with 1 through 3. We put them all at the same proof and blinded uh, everyone, right? So 1 and 2 come in around 120. We took them all down to the same proof, which is a great exercise to compare. I think we need to do that with 4 with the same tasting panel and keep them all the same. That being said, 
Uh, I, I go three. back. Okay, John three. Sanders. Three has got some real nice 13-year MGP, which is a spectacular product. Um, I go back and forth. Okay, fair enough. Um, Robert Rees is asking, favorite whiskey regions and styles that aren't American? Well, uh, that's a tough one. I mean, obviously, I, I was actually, I drank a lot of scotch before bourbon, you know, so uh, mm. I was doing, um, scotch kind of got me into bourbon. Sure. So I, I would say, um, I would say scotch if we're, if we're talking whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, I love the, some Canadian whiskeys out there. There's just so many different blends so many different blend possibilities. And I think that's where bourbon might be going. So um, just with everything, when bourbon was a bourbon in Canada, it was good. We have some in our vintage library that actually says Canadian bourbon. And that was <laughs> a great product, Canadian whiskey blends. Uh, so that's where I'd hang my hat up. And that's what we're trying to match, I think, going on the blending side of bourbon it is to see what's out there from a blending perspective. And, uh, what they're doing is really cool. I think. What What do you mean when when Canadian whiskey was bourbon? It still is bourbon. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Maybe not according to the, according to the no, code. That's a bourbon <laughs> mash. The that's bourbon a, mash. Yeah. yeah. This this yeah. one got like Crown Royal in a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyone can have a bourbon mash, Bill. There yeah. was a time though when it was Canadian bourbon. So yeah. Uh, anyway, um, I think, okay, we got time. Maybe one more question, then I think we're going to let these fine gentlemen go because I'm sure they have other things better to do than being on this shitty little show. So, uh, <laughs> Sugar Kitty, I think you're going to be our last one for the night. Um, it comes down to Top Notch MGP or the Mystery Mash Bill. Which do you like better? I'm not 100% sure I know what you're referring to, Sugar. Um... Yeah, I don't know, Sugar. If you want to let us know what bill, just the mystery, I I don't know. Anyway, um, I think unless someone else has another question, I think we're gonna call it a night. Thank you guys so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Um, I know a lot of the patrons were wanting me to ask you what's coming out new. It seems like you guys have answered that a hundred percent. The, uh, the only thing I'll say is, is the best way to experience it and find out what's new is to come visit us. Come see it for yourself. Take the tours. We have the distillery collection coming out in just a couple weeks, which will be distillery-only releases. You fill, fill your own bottle system in the Rick House. That's where you're going to get our, our rarest, most exclusive products, and that debuts just in a couple weeks. So make the drive down and uh, come check and us out. What does he mean by rarest? I'll wrap it up with my piece. Um, so if you liked our discovery, we actually rebarreled those discoveries in those blends, if, if you understand that. So we saved a couple back and didn't put them in the bottle, rebarreled them. We have single barrel selects from some of our collaborations that we really liked. So there's going to be a lot of cool releases in our LTOs, uh, distillery release on those. Ed, thanks for having us out too. Yeah, absolutely. And Sugar Kitty was talking about Discovery 3 and Discovery 4. That, okay. That makes more sense now, Sugar Kitty. Thank you. I'm I'm sorry. I'm not I'm not that clever apparently. <laughs> um, but again, thank you guys for coming on. Thank all of you. Thank you all for watching. Um, oh, and I guess the last thing we should address is any the planned expansions into other markets. Who's next? Who's getting some stuff next? Uh, we got Michigan coming really soon. We just went into New York. We're just opening up Southern California. Um, and from there, we'll keep expanding. We'll be in about 23 markets uh, by the end of the year. Fantastic. All right, everybody. Until next time, you guys stay safe, stay healthy, drink some more bourbon, and stay rotten. Cheers. 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 Thanks, Ed.